Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service. It was great to have a countdown from the balcony this morning, so thank you for that. Uh, you may notice that I have a sunburn today and windburn. That was from Riverfest yesterday. Does hurt a little bit, but uh, uh, I should have put some sunblock on, so I, I knew better. But uh, somebody said this morning that, well, you're from Rockland, you're advertising lobsters. Well, okay, uh, whatever. <laughs> whatever it takes for you to buy lobsters these days, that would be good. Uh, vital, the screen here is not on. So, okay, so welcome to the service. We're going to ask you to stand, and we are going to begin our time of worship today.
But Lord, we also thank you for that same word of that breath, of that wind of your Holy Spirit that has come to indwell our lives, to give us eternal life, this life of newness and this new transformation that is by and only by your Holy Spirit. So Lord, thank you for the transformation of the Holy Spirit that is changing our minds and our hearts our thoughts, our words, our actions, our motivations, our attitude. Lord, again, we invite your Holy Spirit to come and to fill us to overflowing today. Because without your Holy Spirit, Lord, we are disconnected from the vine. Lord, we're disconnected from your power. We're disconnected from your authority and your might. And we cannot grow without you. We have no nutrients. We have no substance. We have nothing without you. So God, we invite your Holy Spirit to come and to work in our hearts and our, and our lives, even in these moments that are before us today. As we open the scriptures, as the children go to their groups, Lord, we pray for the leaders and those in the nursery and those that are working behind the scenes today. Lord, that they would fill, that you would fill each of us to your Holy Spirit to overflowing. As we go from this place, from the church that is gathered to the church that is scattered this week, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would continue to be in our midst and overflowing in our lives. That, Lord, they would see you living in us. That is our prayer today. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Okay, great. We are going to dismiss our children at this time. Most of them are in the balcony today. So you can head off this way all the way through eighth grade. We have groups for you today. And thank you for the leaders that are here today leading the young people. Okay, it's great to see all of you today. And for those that are joining us online, welcome as well. And uh, we are going to transition to our study time. And Vinyl, that screen is still not working, so... Thank you. A number of times over the years, I have gone to some kind of event where there will be uh, a tasting of chili or a chowder or soup or apple crisp or something like that. And if you've ever gone to an event like that, you get a little tiny container about this size, and they put in a little bit of chili, or they put in a little bit of chowder, and then they give you like a little uh, 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 wooden thing, like a little uh, thing that you would get for the little spoon, like you would get when you were a child at VBS for those little ice cream containers. And then you go and you evaluate, and you just, it's just a little taste. And it's like, mmm, this is good. And go to the next one and go to the next one. And then you kind of rate the chili or the chowder or the, or the dessert. And, and I remember a number of years ago, for a number of years, going to Brewer, and you would do that. Well, Luke is going to give us today a little taste of the Lord Jesus. So my Bible is open this morning to uh, Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and Luke is going to give us a little taste, and Jesus is going to give us a little taste of who he is, of his kingdom, and what he's all about. So that is what we're going to consider this morning. In the first nine verses, in the first 
nine verses of Luke 9. And in the first six verses, Jesus goes and he gives instructions to his 12 disciples, to his 12 apostles. And the word apostle means sent ones. And so he's going to send them out what we would call today a mission trip. They're going to go on a mission. And Jesus goes in these first six verses in Luke 9, and he gives instructions, and he says, you are to go, and I'm going to give you power and authority that you're going to be able to heal people. And they, were, they had that ability. You're going to proclaim the kingdom of God, that there's a new kingdom that's on the scenes. And you're going to go from village to village and to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal people. And that's what's described in the first six verses. And they do so with great success. So let's pick up the story, Luke chapter 9, verse 7. Now remember that Luke is, is giving us a taste of who Jesus is in his kingdom and what he's all about today. So Luke tells us, he says in verse 7, Now Herod, this is Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch, heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed because some were saying that John, John the Baptist, had been raised from the dead. Now, John, uh, Herod Antipas, had just had him beheaded, so that would be a little disturbing if the person that you've just had behead, beheaded has had come back to life, so that's a possibility. Others said that it was Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. So let's put on the screen a question. Who is this man? That's the question that Herod Antipas is asking. Who is this man? But that is the question that all of the population of that whole region of Israel was asking in those days. Who is this man that is sending out his disciples that can do miracles and, and, and proclaiming this new kingdom? Who is this man? So that is the question that is before us this morning. Who is this man? Who is this Jesus of Nazareth. So to help us in our study, I'm going to ask to put a map of the uh, Galilee region up there, and hopefully you can see it pretty well. So first, a little bit about King Herod Antipas. So um, Herod Antipas is the son of Herod the Great, and Herod the Great was uh, King Herod when Jesus was born. So this is many years later. He's died. He had four sons, and after his death, he divided the whole area of Israel into four sections. Two of his sons are going to come into play in our story today. We've already seen one, King Antipas, and he ruled two different sections on this map. Let me highlight. This area here, and his capital was Tiberias. And then also another section down here, right along the Jordan River. Well, around this section right here is where John the Baptist had his ministry, in Bethany on the east side of the Jordan River. The Gospel of Mark tells us that. So that would have been an area where Herod Antipas uh, ruled, and that's how they had the interaction. Now, over here is Herod Philip. He was another son of Herod the Great, and he ruled that area, and his headquarters was in Bethsaida, which we are going to talk about in just a moment. So if you remember the story that Mark tells us in, um, in his gospel about John the Baptist, here Herod Philip and, uh, was married. He got divorced, and King Herod Antipas marries Philip's ex-wife. And they had a daughter. And the story of John the Baptist, remember how that goes? So Herod Antipas marries his wife's ex-wife, uh, 
marries his brother's ex-wife, okay, and, and then the stepdaughter, who is actually King uh, Ant Antipas's niece, comes and dances before them at that party. Remember that? And it is the daughter who comes and asks Antipas for John the Baptist's head because John the Baptist said, no, 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 you cannot go and marry your ex, your brother's ex-wife. And it go over w very well. And so Herod Antipas said, okay, yep, um, beheaded. So the story that we're looking at today that event has just happened. John the Baptist has just been beheaded. Luke doesn't tell us that, but the other Gospels accounts do. The 12 disciples have just gone out and had a very successful ministry. We don't know if it lasted for a few days, maybe a few weeks, maybe even a few months. Luke doesn't give us the timetable here. So they've been out there going in this whole area right here all these towns. And so in verse 7, it tells us that Herod heard about all this was going on. What is going on in my kingdom? And who is this new king? And what is this new kingdom of God that they're talking about? Who is this man? And I want to meet him. I want to kind of see who my competition is. So they ask the question, is this John the Baptist come back to life? That's a possibility. Is it Elijah? Now, why would they think it maybe it's Elijah? Well, if we can put the uh, map and just kind of leave the map uh, there for a moment. So the same place down here where John the Baptist was baptizing all the people, hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of people, down here at Bethany on the east side, this is the same location that Elijah was taken up to heaven hundreds of years earlier. So they could see, you, you could see that it's like, well, maybe Elijah has come back to heaven, from heaven. So let's now put 2 Kings chapter 2 on the screen, verse 11. This is from the Old Testament. It says, as they were walking along, this is Elijah and Elisha, his assistant. They were walking along, talking along together. Suddenly, a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up into heaven in a whirlwind. They never saw him again. So here is this new character on the scene. John the Baptist, he's, he's dead, but there's this new guy. He's doing miracles. Maybe this is Elijah that has come back. And then others said, well, maybe he's just... Uh, a prophet. Maybe Moses has come back. Maybe Isaiah has come back. Maybe Jeremiah has come back. We don't know who this guy is. We don't know who this man is. So Luke tells us this story, and also Matthew, Mark, and John tells us this story, this fair, famous story. All four of them share this story that we're going to look at this morning. The only other story in the Gospels that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all share is the story of the resurrection. So this is a very important story. So this week I've asked you to read the four accounts of the story that's before us because they're all slightly different. And so critics, now why I ha asked you to read those four accounts is that the critics of the gospel and of the Bible and of Jesus, of Christianity, say, aha, this is where the Bible has all kinds of major contradictions. And if you go and just look at it from that point of view, it's like, well, yeah, okay, boy, there's all kinds of contradictions here. Or if you look at it as four witnesses to a major event, all looking at it from slightly different angles and giving slightly different details, these are pieces of a puzzle that we put together, we must put together, and they do go together, I believe, but we just have to go and take the time to put the pieces of the puzzle together. So let's go and put uh, the map of, the, of Galilee back up on the screen and just leave that there for a few moments, please, th and thank you. So let's go and see what happens next, and we are picking up the story in verse 10. 
when the apostles, the disciples, returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. So they, they must have come back with great excitement. You know, amazing things have happened. Then Jesus took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. So they come over here. Their headquarters, this is usually where they are. They come over here. It's a short distance, a couple of miles. It's not very far. And Jesus wants to debrief them. He wants to go and say, okay, all right, guys, what went well? What didn't go well? What lessons did you? And this is what uh, anybody with interns, any teacher with interns would do. This is what he does. Now, in Mark's account, or in Matthew's account, excuse me, it says from this place in Bethsaida, they took a boat ride to a solitary place. Now, down here, all this is a solitary place. It is very isolated. It is a very uh, deserted type of place. There are some major cities here, Roman cities, but all through here. So somewhere in this area here is where the story takes place. Okay? So Matthew tells us that they took a boat to a solitary place. Mark tells us that when this was all over, that they're somewhere down in here, and he tells them to take the boat back to Bethsa Bethsaida. And this is where the storm happens, where Jesus walks on the water. Luke does not give us that story. The other Gospels do. Okay? In verse 11, But the crowds learnt about it and followed him. So all the crowds, the people would live in this area. This is where all the Jewish people would live. And so they heard about it, and Jesus is so popular in these days. This is the height of his popularity. They follow him by the thousands. In verse 14, it says there's 5,000 men. Matthew tells us there's also men and women. So 5, 10, 15,000 people are all following Jesus and his disciples basically out into the wilderness. Okay, let's continue. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. So there is, there's this huge gathering that's happening, thousands of people. Jesus is proclaiming the kingdom of God. There's all of this healing going on. It's an amazing day, an amazing day. Let's continue. Late in the afternoon. Now, let me back up and tell you one other important uh, detail that Luke doesn't tell us. Matthew tells us that this event happens right before the Passover. And we know when that happens. It's always in the spring of the year. So we're in the spring of the year. We're either late March or early April, our time period. The Gospels, besides Luke, tells us that there is a lot of green grass. Wherever they are, there's a lot of green grass. And you see all this green here. There's a lot of green grass. Now, that lasts for only about six weeks out of the year because there's a rainy season. The grass turns very green, kind of like around our Memorial Day. It's very green, very luscious, and then it gets to dry time. And all the grass is like the color of this carpet for most of the year. So we know exactly where they are. And Luke tells us the time of day. And this is very important. The time of day, it says, he says, late afternoon. Now, what is different from Israel to here is they are very close to the equator. I'm always telling you, think of Florida type of weather. That's the weather in Israel. But they're much closer to the equator. So they do not have, as we do, in the summertime, long days of sunlight, and in the wintertime, short days of sunlight. It's a consistent time. So in Israel, between 6 and 7 p.m., around 6.30, it's always sunset. So that's, that's a key thing to put in your mind. So this is late afternoon. It's going to be dark soon, and it gets dark at 6.30. It gets dark fast, and there is 15, 12, 15,000 people that are far away from their homes, and all of a sudden, the disciples say, okay, 
what are we going to do with all of these people? Okay, so let's continue in our story. Late in the afternoon, the twelve disciples came to Jesus and said, Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. And it's going to take them probably a couple of hours to walk back to where they live. And it's going to be dark soon. But this is how Jesus responds. I love his classic. Jesus replied, you all give them something to eat. He says, okay, you guys, you do it. Now, they're all new interns. And interns, this is what you do with interns. You say, okay, intern, go and figure out a way. Go and do it. You got this. Do it. And they're like, what do we do? Again, Luke doesn't tell us, but John tells us. They go out into the crowd, and they're like, does anybody have any food? Right? We know this famous story. Only one boy says, oh, yeah, I, I think I still have my lunch. I never had my lunch. Now, everybody else probably brought their lunch, and they ate it hours ago. And it's been kind of the speculation that I've been asking you, and I've been thinking about, why was it this young boy didn't eat his lunch? And my guess is, with all those kids there running around, he probably was just so excited that he forgot to eat his lunch. So he's the only one. Five little loaves of bread and two fish. So Jesus said, okay, bring it to me. So let's continue the story. So they answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all of this crowd, about 5,000 men were there, plus women and children. But Jesus said to his disciples, have them sit down. And literally what it says is have them recline in groups of about 50 each. So I, got, I did bring my pillow this week. But again, this is what they did. Just like they would if they were at home, this is how they would recline. On that nice green grass. Nice, it's like a big blanket. So there's like a huge blanket. 12, 15,000 people are reclining, waiting for a meal. But there's only five loaves of bread and two fish. But Jesus goes, and it tells us that he blessed it, he broke it. It doesn't say that he cooked the fish, so we don't know about that. He went and he broke it. He gave it to the disciples, and they distributed it. So this great ma miracle happens, and so the disciples did so, and everyone sat down, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. Jesus gave thanks and broke it. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people now notice verse four, this next verse, verse 17. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. How does that happen? I don't have a clue. It's a miracle. How does Jesus take five loaves of bread and two fish and feed thousands of people and they're all full. This great miracle happens. So why does Jesus go? Why does he do this? Jesus gives to them a little taste, a little glimpse of what coming times will be like in the kingdom of God. Now, where do I get that from? Let's turn to the Old Testament. Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 25. Isaiah 25. Now, as the people are eating this meal, and maybe as they're reflecting upon it, these thousands of people, maybe they're like, Wow, this kind of reminds us of Moses when the Israelites were in the wilderness, when they had just come out of Egypt. And remember, they were grumbling, and it's like, we're hungry, we need food. And so the Lord says, okay, Moses, go and look up to heaven, 
and from heaven is going to come manna, this bread-like substance, and there's going to be quail, this, th these birds, and that's what they're going to eat. That's what they're going to eat. So maybe they're thinking about Moses on this occasion. Maybe they're thinking about Elijah. Not Elijah, but Elisha. And remember that story from the Old Testament. There was a hundred men who were hungry. And Elisha did this great miracle with, I think, was it 12 loaves of bread? 10 or 12 loaves of bread. And he feeds a hundred people. But this man, he's had five loaves, two fish, and he's fed thousands of people. But what is Jesus giving them a taste of? Isaiah 25, chapter 25, in verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people, the sheet that covers all nations, he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth the Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Now, the end of John's account, John tells us that some of the people that day said, could this be the prophet, the prophet, the Messiah, the Christ? But most people just kind of went away, you know, scratching their heads. We don't know what just happened. We'd like to have another meal like that. But we don't know what, who this guy is. We don't know who he is. So Jesus has given them a taste for them to think about. Who am I? What is my kingdom all about? Now Luke does not tell us, as I mentioned before, about, I think it's in John, where did I, here we go. John tells us, or the, gospel, the Gospels tell us, that Jesus went up to a high mountain to pray. There's a very high mountain right here. That's why I think that it may be happening somewhere down in here. Not sure. Uh, there is, it, it is not a typical mountain. It is just this outburst of land that just like goes way up and it's flat and they built a little town there, but it's right there. And that would have been a good place for Jesus to go on that mountain because the imagery I think that Jesus wants is that Isaiah 25. There's the mountain. They would have seen it. That was like the backdrop of this whole story. Jesus goes up onto the mountain to pray he sends his disciples out into the boat back this way. They actually end up over here because of that's where they end up the next morning. And Jesus walks on the water. So with the feeding of thousands, the walking on water, and then Luke doesn't tell us, but the other gospels tell us that shortly later, Jesus goes again, comes, and we know for sure, comes down in this area, way down to here, and he feeds 4,000 men and women and children that time. And most likely this time they were not Jewish people but Gentile people. And again he's giving clues to his disciples of who he is. And so let's continue back in our story in Luke. Luke verse, chapter 9 verse 18. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him so some period of time has gone by. This could be up to a year later. There's a big jump here, I think, either months or years later. And again, Luke doesn't tell us, but he has taken, um, what did I do with my clicker? Far north, off the map, all the way up to Caesarea Philippi, named after Herod Philip. And he takes them way up there. And this is where this uh, story takes place. So once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? So they're like, okay, Jesus, I've given you all kinds of clues. 
I've given the people all kinds of clues. Who are they saying now that I am? And they give the exact same answers at the beginning of the story. They say, they, they replied, some say John the Baptist. He's come back to life. Others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. So they're basically they're saying, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Nobody knows exactly who you are. So then in this famous, famous question, Jesus says, okay, guys, who do you all say that I am? And what does Luke tell us? Peter answers for the group, and he says, you are God's Messiah. You're God's Christ. In Matthew, he says it this way, Matthew 16, verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We finally figured it out. But it had taken them several years to get to that point. Who is this man? You are Christ, the Son of the living God. So the feeding of the 5,000 the walking on the water, the feeding of four more thousand people, the disciples were finally able to disc discover who Jesus really was. It took them a long, long time. Why did it take so long? Jesus was so human. He, he, he looked like them. He acted like us without sin, but he was so human. But they're like, who is this? But they finally discovered who Jesus was. So here's the takeaway this morning. The true identity of Jesus was revealed at a meal, at this mega meal of thousands of people. They finally figured it out. It's like, ah, oh, the true identity of Jesus was revealed at a meal. So some application. This is a very familiar and famous story. So how do we apply this to our lives today? I suppose there are many ways, but I would like to go and kind of focus on these thoughts. Jesus met a need, a great need that day in the wilderness. What was that need? They needed food. And Jesus provided food. food. Now today... What are the needs that are around us in our community, in Old Town, in the surrounding area? What are the needs? Well, guess what? One of the basic needs still today is food. That's why we've helped start Caring Community Covered. That's why we've asked you this week to make baked goods. That's why we went and got sunburns yesterday at Riverfest to go and to sell uh, baked goods to raise money for the food pantry. How much did we raise yesterday, Jerry? Do you know? Over $400, so thank you. So that goes towards the food pantry to help people with food and cleaning supplies and just the basic things of life that many people in our community doesn't have. But there's other basic needs in this community be beyond food. Uh, there are such important things as people needing to know the meaning and purpose of life. There's a lot of people that need to know the basic meaning of purpose in life. Uh, yesterday and Friday evening to see the thousands of people that came to Riverfest again just reminded me as it does every year that even in this community there are many sheep who need a shepherd many people that need to know the purpose and meaning of life and that's very basic or others need to know of inti intimacy and in close relationships to know of community to experience the love and the joy and the hope and the peace that is only found in God. People all around us, they have those basic needs. And how do we, how do we meet those needs, those felt needs? Now, in this world, UBC, as a church family, we are never, ever going to be able to meet all the needs of this community. We're never going to be able to feed all the people that need to be fed. We're going to do our best, right, to work with other groups to do that. And we're never going to be able to meet all of the people's needs of purpose and meaning, of intimacy or relationships or community. 
But we can do our part, and we can accomplish much in doing that. So how do we do that? I would suggest to you today that we offer a little taste of heaven. We offer a little taste of the kingdom of God, because that's all we can do for people, as we do with the food pantry, that we give them some food. We can't give them a whole year supply of food or a whole lifetime supply of food, but we give them a taste of that, of what one day the kingdom of God will be like. But we can give people a taste of meaning and purpose that only God gives to us, or intimacy, or close relationships, or community. We can go and give them a taste. What would that look like? Well, we can certainly do that on a Sunday morning, as we are today, Uh, as when the church is gathered together. We can give people, we can invite people to come with us and to experience that little taste of what Jesus is all about, what the kingdom is all about, his kingdom, and, and, and all that Jesus does. We can give them that taste. And so I would encourage you as in the days to come to invite more people to this place when the church is gathered together on a Sunday morning. But I would also encourage you during the week, Monday through Saturday, when the church is scattered, when we are all scattered in different places, we're at work, we're at homes, we're wherever, we can do the same thing. What does that look like? Well, invite somebody that needs a taste of Jesus, a taste of the kingdom of God. Invite them to a life group. We're starting all these life groups and, and groups during the week. Think about that in the future. Or to some kind of group, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Or it can be uh, to invite um, someone to a church supper. It's like, well, we haven't been having any church suppers. Well, we're going to start doing that again. And I have a dream, and it's only a dream at this point, and it might be your dream as well, that sometime between now and the end of this year that we could have a big church potluck. We're probably not going to be able to have a big harvest supper this year with, you know, the, the, the turkey and, and all that, because we don't have a kitchen staff at this point. But how about a potluck meal? Everyone bring your favorite recipe. You do that well, right? And bring it and have a great meal together. Maybe sometime in late October, early November, sometime in November. And invite some of your friends so they can get a glimpse of what we're all about and what Jesus is all about and his kingdom. So that, that is a way to think about doing that. So invite people to get a taste, a glimpse of something greater, to give them a taste of something greater. Why are you like you are? Give them a taste of that. Allow them to experience that, even if it's just for a few hours, if it's just for a brief period of time. Now, I've been thinking about all this very seriously, and our focus, if we're going to do this, our focus cannot be on ourselves. Our focus must be upon Jesus. Because if people just come and see that our focus is just on ourselves, they're going to stay home. But if they see the focus on Jesus and his kingdom and what Jesus is all about, they're going to be intrigued, and they are going to want another taste, and another taste, and another taste, and another taste. Now, we live in a time... A very, very interesting time when the question of the hour is, what is a Jesus? I've heard that recently from a young man. What is a Jesus? They don't even know that Jesus was a person, that Jesus is a person. What is a Jesus? No, Jesus is a person. Who is Jesus? And that we can go and we can help people to understand who the person of Jesus is, that he is the Christ the anointed king of God who brings salvation and new life to the whole world. And we'll close with this in John 10.10. How many times have we seen this recently? This is what Jesus said. I have come that they may have life. It's eternal life is the word there. I have come that they may have eternal life. This new life, this whole new experience of life, purpose and meaning and relationship with God and and with other people and this intimacy and community and all that people dream about. Love and hope and joy and peace. This is what Jesus offers to people. 
And he says, and have it to the full, to have it in abundance, to be overflowing with this new life. That is what we're to give people a taste of, just a little bit of a taste of experience. And when they do, they're going to be very excited of what they discover about Jesus. So we can offer a little taste, a little glimpse of Jesus and his kingdom wherever we are, whether it's on a Sunday morning at church or during the week. Now, we did an experiment uh, last Saturday evening, and some of you were involved in that. And we're going to give you in some pictures on the screen and just a, a, a few short stories of really what we're talking about this morning. So can we put the first picture on the screen? Yeah. So this is over in Bradley. This is one of the locations of the Food and Friends locations in Bradley. And uh, uh, this was at the Bartlett's house, Dave and Connie's house. Uh, some of their family was there. A number of their neighbors were there. Um, Non-church people were there. And that's what we're talking about. Because in that time, the neighbors were able to get a little taste, a little glimpse of what being a Christian is all about. That Christians are not scary, that they're not uh, wackos or whatever, and they enjoy food and a good time like anybody else. Okay, let's go to the next picture. This is Old Town. Ah, yeah, this is at John and Nancy Ward's house. You recognize these folks. So church people were there, uh, non-church people were there, neighbors were there. Go to the next picture, please, Zach. There's John doing what he does so well, grilling. Next picture. Yeah, some of their family were there. Next picture. Recognize these folks from our church. Next, pic next picture. Having a good meal together. Next picture. More good times. Next picture. Next picture. See, they did really well. They took pictures like we asked. My group, we forgot. Next picture, if there is one. That may be the last one. Okay. So there were uh, five of these groups that met on that evening. My group met at my house. Uh, my group, uh, a group met at my house um, from Milford. So the Milford folks came to my house, and that worked out really well. And I think we had a really good, really good time. Very good time. Um, some people have been disappointed that have had the groups that they invited so many of their neighbors and only a few of the neighbors came. So is that a loss or a win? I would say that's a great win. One is that you invited your neighbors. That's a win right there. A second win is that some of your neighbors came. I think for every group there was somebody that was invited that came to the group. That's a huge win. And it's even a huge win that some of the neighbors didn't come, but they were invited, and they knew they were invited, and they may come to a future time. Now, I, I was a little down on myself um, last week. I want to share this story in closing. So uh, I don't really know my neighbors really well after all of these years, but there was this one young couple that lives right next to me, university age, maybe late 20s, that um, a year and a half ago, it was a snowstorm, and they had just moved here to Orono from California, and they got their car stuck in the big snowbank coming off Main Street, which we share a driveway. So I was just out there shoveling. I had my uh, snow scoop thing. I put it over my shoulder. I went out. I asked them, uh, is this a front-wheel drive or a rear-wheel drive car? They're like, we don't know. Okay. Uh, the young man jumped out. He was in the passenger seat. Uh, the young lady was driving. He jumps out, goes to his apartment, their apartment, to get a shovel, I think. So I said, I'm assuming this is a little car. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume this is a front-wheel drive. So I go, and I take the, the scoop and do around the front-wheel drive, around the front, and I said, back up a little bit, and boom, she got out of the snowbank before the guy even came back out. But since that time, oh my goodness, you thought I'd given them a million dollars. Every time, they wave and wave. So they are by far, they've been the friendliest neighbors I think I've ever had since living there. And then uh, at the beginning of last summer, not this summer, last summer, they decide to get a little puppy. 
It was like smaller than most kittens, this little tiny puppy. And so they're always out there in the yard. And then when it came summertime, they bought a, a pool. They put water in it just for the puppy. The puppy had no interest in that water. Uh, and then they had a big umbrella, everything for that puppy. And so uh, oftentimes we would walk at the same time, usually passing each other and a high hot, and they'd always give me an update on the puppy and, and, and all this stuff. So, um, so in the back of my mind, knowing that this food and friend time was coming up, it's like, I'm gonna invite this couple and I'm pretty sure they will come. I, I'm pretty sure, I think we've built enough of a connection that they will come. So I went over a week ago Thursday or we could go Wednesday and so they live in this huge apartment house and I get up to out back where I had never been before and I, I discovered there was three doors outside doors I was like uh oh I don't even know which apartment they live in so it's one of these I was like well okay and I had gone there with such enthusiasm so I go and I knock on the door and this lady this young lady comes to the door but not the lady I was expecting so I said, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm looking for the couple with the little puppy. It's like, oh, you have the right apartment. But they moved about two weeks ago and went back to California. And I now have her, their apartment. It's like, no! Oh, no! I waited too long. So, but uh, it's like, okay. So I've been, people have encouraged me this week. It's like, but at least you thought about them and at least you attempted to do it. So don't be too down on yourself, but don't wait so long next time. That's the, that's the lesson there, right? Yeah. So this is what we're to be doing on an ongoing basis. So, you know, invite some people over for Christmas or a birthday or, yeah. Uh, somebody asked me yesterday for trunk or treat. Uh, can we invite non-church people to take part? Absolutely, because that fits in to exactly what we're talking about. The more time that we can... Uh, be around and give people a taste of who Jesus is. So let's take a moment to pray. Father, this is really practical, practical stuff. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that 2,000 years ago he came to earth and as Luke portrays him, he was the perfect man. He was one like Moses, who was able to do great things even in the wilderness among the great crowds. But he was also more than a man. He was God himself come to earth. And Lord, it took them a while to figure all that out. And for us here in this room, in this building, it took us a while to figure out exactly who Jesus was ourselves. And for some of us, we're still exploring that even this very morning. So, Lord, give us the ability to understand exactly who is this man, this Jesus guy, and reveal to us his true identity. And, Lord, help us to go and to help other people discover who Jesus is in their own time and in their own way. And, Lord, to, for us to give them a taste of who Jesus is, his kingdom, and what he's all about. So, Lord, help us do that through your Holy Spirit. But Lord, today, as we finish up our time, this worship gathering today, this worship service, we want to exalt Jesus, for we have discovered, as Peter and the disciples did long ago, that he is indeed the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we want to worship him as the Christ today, the Messiah, the great prophet, the great anointed king, the king of kings and lord of lords of the universe. And we want to celebrate that he is indeed God, the Son of God, the living God, so, Lord, give us the strength and the breath to sing out this morning that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing together this very familiar chorus.
Okay, you may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Let me share with you quite a few announcements. So if you could listen very closely, because I'm sure there's one or more of these announcements that may pertain to you. So at about uh, in a few minutes from now, uh, the teens, the students, uh, we're going off on an activity to Bangor. We're going to have pizza. We're going to go to Urban Air. So if you are in grades uh, fifth grade and older, you are invited. So those are all of the details right there. For men, there's a men's breakfast this coming Saturday at 7 a.m. at Governor's. All of you are invited. Invite some men to join you. There's plenty of room over there. Uh, for everyone, men and women, next Saturday is a church work day starting at 8.30 to 10.30. We only have a few projects to do. If you can't make it on Saturday, but you are here and have some muscles, uh, there are three air conditioners that have been taken out, but they need to be taken out to the back shed, okay? Uh, for families with children, elementary children, preschool, elementary age, next Saturday at 1 p.m. down in Levant uh, is going to be a painting of pumpkins, uh, the corn maze, ice cream cone at the end. So that is next Saturday at 1 p.m. Next Sunday, for all church members, there is a short uh, October business meeting. So we're just going to give you a quick update. It's not going to be a long meeting, but that will be right after the service next Sunday. Now, looking forward a little bit in the next month or so, we are hoping to start real soon uh, refreshments again on Sunday morning after the service. So two people have signed up so far to go and to make some refreshments. We're looking for a coordinator. We might have one already, but we're looking for at least six people that on some kind of regular basis would be willing to make some uh, refreshments for us on Sunday morning. And then looking forward even further, uh, trunk or treat. We're still hoping to do that. We have four people that have committed so far. We need at least six or more. So if you have not talked to me about that yet, please let me know so we can get that uh, in the planning stages. So there's a lot of announcements, a lot of things. So this is coming a really busy time of the year. We're kind of post-pandemic now, kind of getting back to our normal, somewhat normal schedule. So that is a good thing. Uh, I don't think I have any special prayer requests today. Nobody's in the hospital that I know of. No one's seriously ill. So that is very rare these days. So that is a good thing. So I'm going to ask us just to stand and we're going to close in prayer this morning. Jesus, you are so wonderful, as we have just sung. You're beautiful, you're wonderful, you're powerful, and we can call you our Lord and Savior. Lord, you've been given titles such as Prince of Peace, Almighty God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, the the savior of the whole world of the nations Lord so many titles that we can proclaim to you today but Lord we can also proclaim that you are our friend the one that is closer than a brother one that is closest closest to us as a closest relative always in a sense at our elbow always there day and night never leaving us never forsaking us oh Jesus we worship you today we are so grateful, we are so grateful for who you are, that you revealed yourself to us, that you have redeemed us by being our substitute on the cross, and that you now live with us through your Holy Spirit in every hour and every moment, giving us the strength and the power that we need for life, and to be that godly example among our friends and neighbors. So Lord, go with us this day and this week and Lord I ask your blessing upon your people that you would bless them strengthen them in their inner spirit that we would be more like the Lord Jesus as we go through this week and to that end we would pray in Jesus name Amen go and have a great day